Hey everybody, who's your Jedi here with another review for you. This time I'm talking episode 6 of Legends of Tomorrow called Star City 2046. And, uh, you know, this is very much your classic go into the future that's horrible sort of thing from um, comics. And those those kind of stories are, are ones that I, I really often enjoy, but it always annoys me to some degree that the future is always bad. Now, okay, if the future is good, then the heroes really have no reason to change it. But it, I've always thought it'd be kind of interesting to see if the future was kind of a mixed place. It's sort of like, well, do we change the timeline? Do we not? But, you know, simplicity, right? So, ahem, let's kind of just get right into things. Uh, now, since we only have the one episode to really play around with things, they really can't get into a lot of details about what all happened the you know what happened to everybody else and and all of this other stuff oliver just sort of sums it up quite simply as everybody's gone basically meaning they either died pretty much clear, not exact not explicitly stated but very heavily hinted to be th what happened to diggle the diggle diggle got killed by deathstroke too and everybody else either got killed or just packed up and left town to you know start over again somewhere else uh, now, that's all well and good, but here's the thing. Let's take a look at um, Grant Wilson here. Now, Grant Wilson is a character for the comics. In fact, he was the first person to bear the name Ravager. Uh, he attacked the Teen Titans to try and get his father's approval. He ended up getting killed, and that was a big part of what started Deathstroke and his uh, pretty much endless messing around with the Teen Titans. Of course, it also helped lead into the Judas Contract story, which is a badass story. I mean, when you can read something that was written in like the early 1980s and you're still like, wow, that's pretty awesome, you, you know you got something that's good. Jewish country. Good, good stuff. <clears throat> uh, anyway, getting back into things. Um, right. So they said that um, you know Grant Wilson conquered Star City about 15 years ago. But if you take a look at this guy, he's at best in his early 30s, right? So that means he must have organized his army and conquered the city when he was like barely old enough to drive. Now granted the guy's Australian and uh, here in the United States you can't drive until you're 15 and a half with a learner's permit and in the presence of an adult. Now uh, I don't know what the driving age is in Australia but I'm gonna assume it's probably something pretty similar. Uh, so yeah some teenage kid leading an army conquering an entire city uh yeah i kind of have to call bullshit on that um but okay let, let's let's not worry about that too much uh now there was some stuff here like where sarah is surprised that slade had a son well she knew that slade had a son except i mean slade explicitly mentioned his son joey and that's um Grant Wilson's brother Jericho, Joe Wilson. Uh, now here, she so he's like, wait a minute, so you, like you're not Joe Wilson or something like that, or you're Joe Wilson, or that would have been the reasonable reaction. Here she seems surprised that he, Slade had a son. Again, as I said, even though that was something that was explicitly told to her by Slade himself back in season two. So. Yeah, that, that doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense, but okay, she's been through a lot. Maybe coming back from the dead, she forgot a few things that she'd learned. You know, okay, whatever. Details, right? Details. Um, so apart from that, though, nothing really particular to say about uh, Grant Wilson. I just looked at him, though, like the way they had this guy styled up made him look a little bit too much like a uh, Winter Soldier from the Marvel movies for my personal tastes. But uh, OK, whatever. And it was definitely very cool to see old Oliver taking on uh, Grant Wilson. Very cool there. You know, the whole Oliver having lost an arm thing, a very obvious nod to the dark, the famous Dark Knight Return story from uh, 1986, uh, one of the great masterpieces of Frank Miller. Uh, do yourself a favor and don't read the, the, the sequel to that. It was quite literally one of the worst mainstream comic book stories I have ever read in my life. And it looked like it was colored by somebody who was drunk off their ass. 
seriously, terrible story. Do not read it. <clears throat> anyway, getting on, getting back into things. Um, Oliver, we finally get to see Oliver with not quite the famous uh, goofy ass devil beard that he's um, supportive, supposedly well known for in the comics. But uh, well, I should say goatee, I guess I should say. But here we do get to see him with a beard, and um, certainly very cool for to have Stephen Amell come on and do a guest spot on the show. And you know, he's been mentioning on Twitter and Facebook for quite a while that he was really pumped to do this episode. Uh, so, you know, cool on... Sorry, I think I heard my phone going off. Well, whatever, it is. I'll call him back. Uh, <clears throat> uh, so anyways, he's obviously very, very pumped about this. And in fact, he was actually, I was reading today that he was saying that he'd be totally down for guest starring on Supergirl at some point. So, you know, points to Stephen Amell. You know, this, the stuff with Constantine. Uh, the man, The man's a real team player. Uh, give him that. Um, I also really liked how when we do get a good look at Oliver's uh, mechanical arm, we can see the Star Labs logo on it, kind of giving a little bit of a hint as to maybe what happened with uh, the Flash and maybe some of the other people from uh, the CW-verse. But, you know, whatever. The big deal uh, there, not, not, not a hugely big deal there. Um, now, I have a little bit of mixed feelings about this whole uh, Connor Hawk situation. Um, again, since they only had a whole, one episode to really play around with Connor as a character, you know, have it's like, I'm Connor Huck. Oh, yeah, I mean, yeah, my real name's John Diggle Jr., but I don't call myself that. It's, as far as I'm concerned, my name's Connor Hawk, because I don't deserve to be called John Diggle Jr., because I failed to save my dad from Deathstroke. And, you know, I don't know what happened to my mom and my sister. The writers didn't have time to mention that. Uh, okay, okay. You know, and, you know, of course, Connor Hawk is... A, is like the person's the character green, the second Green Arrow's proper name in the comics. Now having that just be an alias and having him be John Diggle's son, well, I'm sure that probably seems a little bit contrived to some people, but I understand why the writers went there because if Connor Hawk is just some dude who you know grabbed a costume and started calling himself Green Arrow, it's just like, who the hell are you, kid? But if he's Diggle's son, well, that does a lot of goes a long way in establishing his bona fides and why Oliver would very quickly w fall into the role of you know accepting him as his successor to as Green Arrow and again it is kind of interesting that him being told like look don't don't try and bear this weight on your shoulders even though bearing resp guilt for things that aren't really your fault is one of the great Oliver Queen fortes and I really love how, you know, he's even kind of referred to as, like, you're just some punk in a costume. Again, very reminiscent of something that was said to Terry McGinnis when he first uh, donned the Batman costume in Batman Beyond. And then even further, uh, furthering the whole Batman Beyond theme at the very end, it's like Oliver, even though he's something like probably 60-something years old, is you know, busting out the computer and is going to be helping uh, uh, the next generation hero save their city. Again, extraordinarily reminiscent of what happened with Bruce Wayne and Terry McGinnis on Batman Beyond. And uh, speaking of uh, old-timey uh, stuff, uh, the promos for this episode even said that you know they have failed their city. And I was so hoping that Oliver, when he went to fight uh, Grant Wilson, said was going to say to him, "Grant Wilson, you have failed this city." I was so hoping for that, and we didn't get it. Because, man, they don't break that out very much anymore. I think they've only done that once or twice since uh, season one. And each time that's been like, oh, man, somebody is getting the mother of all ass kickings now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, I do like, though, what they did with Connor Hawk. I mean, they did, again, have only about an hour to really play around with him as a character. But it was a nice job. And again, this is another seed potentially sown for a character they could bring back in a future season. Of course, if they succeed with this whole situation, then this timeline goes away. And 
Rip, Rip and Sarah's interactions here in this episode really call forth an interesting philosophical question. You know, Rip at first is like, look, this timeline, it's not for sure. Let's just get the hell out of here. He even says, these people don't matter. And this is one of the things that's always kind of bugged me about various time travel stories where heroes go somewhere and are like, oh, we have to change history so that this, this world doesn't come to pass. Well, okay, that's all well and good and understandable, but... If you erase that timeline from history, then you erase the line, timeline, all those millions and billions of people who would have existed in that world, not to mention all the millions and billions of people that would have been born after that particular time in that timeline. You are literally erasing an entire future history of the human race and every single person that would exist in it for your own reasons. And I've always thought it would be really fascinating to see somebody who's like, you know, those time cop kind of characters, like the time masters are, pop up and say, hey, who the hell are you to erase billions of people from history just because you don't like the way the future plays out? Now, granted, that's subtly a little bit of what's going on here. I mean, that's kind of the stance the time masters are taking with Rip to a degree, but they're more like, uh, yeah, Vandal Savage, he's just part of the natural order of things. We can't go dicking around with history just because he killed your wife and kid. But, again, that's not an explicit thing. But, again, you know, just sort of an idea that um, has occurred to me when I've watched stories like this. But I do like how Rip sort of sums it up. You know, that at, at the end, when he's kind of come around to Sarah's point of view a little bit, it's like, you know what? Everybody matters. We're going to fight for Everybody, wherever we go, because we're the good guys, and that's what we do. Of course, the contrast to that that we see this episode is what's going on with Snart and Mick. You know, Mick, once again, this takes the time to really sort of flesh him out some more. Mick's basically in hog heaven. This is, he's, he even gives this whole speech. He's like, dude, this is everything we've ever wanted. And Snart's like, uh... Yeah, man, this place is kind of cool and all, but there's no challenge to being a criminal here. Plus, there's the whole, hey, Vandal Savage is going to rule the world. I mean, you know, he was kind of forgetting that eventually Vandal Savage is going to come along and kick over the anthill in this place. Now, granted, that's not going to happen for 120 years for sure long after Mick would have been dead, but still, we don't know exactly when in that timeline that Rip came from, uh, Vandal Savage got around to conquering Star City, or, you know, whatever. And this, of course, leads to the big confrontation with Snart knocking Mick out, and, you know, them having that big confrontation back at the ship, where Snart's like, dude, we're partners, but understand, I'm I'm the charge. You're the, I'm the brains. You're the muscle. You do what I say. And you know, Mick being all up in the face, like, hey man, are you really buying into this whole thing of saving the world and trying to be a noble good guy hero? You know, that's not who you are. That's bull. You know, and I love how he puts it. You know what I want from this world to watch it burn. And, yeah, they're laying it on a little thick from uh, the Nolan Batman movies there. But still, that is in keeping with this particular version of Heat Wave. And, you know, this is an interesting crossroads for these two characters. You know, Snart and came, and Mick came in here thinking, like, dude, this time travel thing, we are going to use this to pull the most badass heists ever. But Snart's kind of realized, like hey, this situation is a little bit bigger than just lining my pockets. Plus, as reluctant as he might be to admit it, he's come to actually like some of the people on the team. And he does genuinely care about what happens to them. Now, it might just be more of, hey, nobody messes with people who I consider part of my crew, rather than, say, the friendly camaraderie that we're seeing between the other characters. But still. You take what you can get from Snart. And even Mick is not entirely averse to at least liking the Ray a little bit for having, you know, helped them out. And of course, this all kind of leads into the big confrontation with Mick saying, like, dude, you ever raise a hand to me again, and we're going to throw down. 
And Snart knows Mick ain't joking about this. So, personally, we we've been told that not everybody's going to make it out of this season alive. And I got to say, if I'm thinking anybody else is going to get catch the axe, I'm thinking it's going to be Mick. Mick is my number one choice for the next person on this team who's probably going to die. <clears throat> but uh, I guess we'll have to see how that plays out. Um, let's see. Um, the whole subplot with... Ray and Kendra and Jackson Stein. I mean, you know, that, that that's cute and all. It was definitely nice to have something a little bit more lighthearted to sort of offset all the doom and gloom that's going on here. Um, and I do like that, you know, Stein kind of had him trying to be helpful blow up in his face. And, you know, Jack's genuinely being appreciative of Stein trying, you know, it's like, hey, man, I got your back. You know, Stein being the wingman there. Kind of give him advice. It's like, hey man, you met my younger son. You know, I was I was a bit of a player. You gotta put yourself out there, which is kind of hilarious coming from a guy <laughs> that old. But you know, Stein's not exactly wrong. Uh, but I do like how they ultimately deal with the whole situation with Kendra saying, like, look, uh, my life is super crazy. I just saw a guy who his everything tells me I was destined to be with die a little while ago. I'm not really ready for dating. And Ray's is like, uh, uh, yeah, okay, cool. I get you. And, of course, Jax is also disappointed. But, again, I, I do like how they how Ray kind of points. It's like, look, you know, we're all adults here. You know, we can candle something like this. And even then, after Kendra's kind of said, uh, thanks but no thanks, you know, Ray and Jax have that nice little moment together where they're just like, Alright, anyway, I guess I better go see what my phone wants, because uh, God knows it's probably completely and utterly unimportant, but uh, I can't stand my phone making the noise. So, with that said, guys, I'm going to call it here. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, and subscribe. Of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Hoosier Jedi, and please also join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.